Thank you everyone, good evening, and I'm um, very uh, pleased to be with you today, and I'm uh, very pleased to, um, to the friendship that we have with you and your communities. Uh, it's been very grateful, and I've been very grateful for this friendship for us as a project and for our farmers who are, uh, this friendship is touching their lives in many ways. The northwest uh, corner of the country has been a great uh, place for us and has taken our message from this corner, south and east, and, uh, and, uh, and through the, uh, the anchor that we, uh, of followers we developed here, we were able to make many more friends throughout the country. So thank you very much for all the activists who are working in support of Crown Fair Trade and the Blessed Fair Trade Association in Portland region. Really, it's, a, it's been a wonderful uh, experience and journey we have together. And I would like to thank uh, Equal Exchange for hosting me here today. I'm very honored to be hosted by one of the fair trade pioneers. Uh, really, uh, even though you didn't uh, yet buy uh, olive oil, uh, you have made great uh, contributions to our success because we are selling to a movement that you were pioneers in building uh, here in the United States and in Europe and across the world. Uh, if it wasn't for the presence of a fair trade movement and social responsibility in, in sourcing products from around the world, this, this whole culture that we are part of now wouldn't have existed and we as a project wouldn't have existed. So thank you for the work that you've done and for taking that uh, leadership in, in creating this movement and fostering its, uh, its development throughout. And it's really an honor for me to be <coughs> at Equal Exchange tonight. I would like to present to you uh, the Canal Fair Trade, what it's trying to do, how it started, and our successes, some of the challenges we face and we face, and uh, where we go. Uh, Canal Fair Trade, we position ourselves as a mission-based business that aims to uh, empower marginalized uh, producers in Palestine caught in the midst of conflict to sustain their livelihood. And, uh, and, and, and stay in their villages and support their livelihood and their lands. So to that end, we engaged in, a, in setting up a model for sustainable trade. Why uh, sustainable trade? Because sustainable trade is uh, grounded in generating economic value. Uh, in, uh, it's invested in the reduction of poverty and inequality. Uh, it's, uh, it's invested in, in uh, regenerating the environmental resource base that produces the product. And it's uh, to be carried out within an open and accountable and transparent system of governance so that a uh, system of organization that we're producing through is sustainable. So this is a perfect model for us to achieve this livelihood sustainability that we're trying to do. So in order to do that, to achieve that, we went and developed uh, a model for fair trade and organic farming. Uh, and why fair trade? Because I encountered the idea of fair trade. It's a, it's a concept that tries it in, in, its, in its intellectual content to address disparities between the conditions of margin, marginalized producers or producers in the global south that who are uh, uh, facing uh, great challenges and the conditions of producers in the uh, industrialized countries who are sometimes capitalized and sometimes subsidized. So fair trade tries to give that market entry to the marginalized producers in the South. So it was a perfect outfit for us to uh, build on and organize through. 
it is normally invested, del works del deliberately with marginalized producers. It tries to cultivate trade and market forces towards a developing outcome uh, or impact in, uh, in conditions of poverty, conditions of marginalization. And so for us <coughs> in Palestine, this is a perfect venue to provide the empowerment that we're trying to provide through the concept of fair trade. In combination, organic is about environmental sustainability, factoring the uh, environmental impact of the trade practice, of the production practice, and uh, the uh, investment in uh, the uh, regeneration capacity of the land, of the soil, of the, of the farms that we are working with, protecting the health of the low of the ecosystem so it is sustainable and protecting the, the health of the farmers and the workers engaged in the production process. All of this what led us to this concept of establishing Canaan and the Palestine Fair Trade Association. So what we have today, and I will go over their development, we have two organizations. One called the Palestine Fair Trade Association and it's a union of uh, 49 cooperatives today. There are 43 farmers' cooperatives and six women cooperatives, producers' cooperatives. And I also established a commercial business that is invested in these cooperatives, invested in, in developing the market for these cooperatives and cultivating these market forces in the West, in Europe and North America, bringing, it to, bring it, bringing these forces to the development aspect of these cooperatives. And uh, Canaan is... Uh, uh, it, today is uh, uh, selling these products in 15 countries around the world. The organic program and certification, we have 1,700 farmers, about about 1,200 of them between certified fair trade and organic, about 1,000 certified organic. Uh, the organic farms that are certified are 4,300 hectares, mostly olive but we also have almonds and we have uh, annual crops that we plant, tomatoes and wheat and, uh, uh, and sesame seeds and, and other crops. This is uh, the concept. This is the theoretical background of what we are trying to do. And now how we went by and doing it or why. <coughs> uh, before we go into that here, this is a slide of the location of the project so you can uh, picture it in the world. Uh, the bottom, uh, Jerusalem would be here, just so you know, this is Ramallah, and Nablus is here, and Jenin up there. Our project is based in Jenin, uh, the, uh, the green numbers on the map are the villages that we are active in. As you see, we are mainly active in the, sp in the stretch between Nablus and Jenin, and we have a cluster of villages in Ramallah area and Salfit area. This is uh, Salfit and this is Ramallah. These are Ramallah villages and some of the Salfit villages. And we have a couple of villages in, uh, in Derbalot. One of them is a women cooperative and one of them is a farmer's cooperative. Uh, so this is how we are spread throughout the West Bank. Uh, the, this map, normally you would see maps a lot about Palestine in, in, in political uh, terms. This is a map in in farmers' terms, these shaded, dark shaded areas are areas where the farmers, if their farm are in these areas, denied access. They cannot reach their farm. They are either behind the fence or behind the wall. The red line is the wall uh, that is throughout the West Bank. And uh, in, the, in, in this east or in the middle here, these are uh, areas, dark shaded areas, would be around settlements where the army does not allow the farmers to enter into these areas. So they are either military zone or settlement zone where Palestinians cannot enter. The, the sli slightly shaded areas are areas where the farmers are challenged access. The Israel consider them Israel, they are classified them as area C. So they are either pending confiscation or trying to and limit the farmers' access, so they, they, they have a grounds for confiscating the land, uh, and the farmers are challenged, sometimes permitted, sometimes not permitted to access these farms. In the light areas, farmers mostly access their farms in stable conditions, and when there is no uh, instability, when there is instability, it's also somewhat uh, the restriction of the movement is challenging. So these are the conditions, 
and the distribution so you, you see the context where we are in. And we, to be honest with you, deliberately we were working because the conditions in 2004 when we started, 2005, were a lot worse than today. And we, the mobility was very, very difficult. We were uh, at times having to collect the oil at night between the, from villages and the farmers. So we, uh, we made a point of actually being between Nablus and Janine. Number one, it is, uh, it is uh, from the development aspect, it's, uh, it's one of the most excluded because it's the farthest from the center of attention in Ramallah and Jerusalem because most of the development agencies would have their offices either in Jerusalem or Ramallah and wouldn't want to venture all the way to Janine. That would be too much risk for them to come and uh, try to have their uh, intervention. And on the other hand, for us to even operate, we, we needed to be in, a, in an area where we can ourselves be mobile uh, in, in there. But now we are moving into the south or the center, the Kalkili and Tulkirin area where we have established the program and we can do better. So the, the foundation of the Palestine Fair Trade Association first, uh, <coughs> I encountered the idea of fair trade in Madison, Wisconsin. I was, I, as I was doing my PhD there, and uh, it was actually equal exchange coffee. And <laughs> a friend of mine, I had a restaurant in Madison, and my friend had Michael, Michelangelo's coffee at, on State Street, and he's, he brought in the equal exchange coffee and started talking to me about the concept of fair trade. It was a fascinating thing. And, uh, and I really, uh, in, of course, started learning more about it, what fair trade is. And from the very beginning, when I uh, understood the concept, I thought this would be a great thing to bring to Palestine at some point, because I know, I mean, I've, I grew up as a farmer, um, uh, son of a farmer, and I've always known the excellent product our, our farmers produce, and their challenges normally is market, 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 whether we can have market for the product or not. So I thought, wow, if there is such a thing can, it can happen for the senior farmers to bring their, their product to market. But uh, when I went in 2003 to do my PhD research, it was not just would it be nice. I mean, the, uh, the conditions of the farmers at the time were in Palestine, they were uh, totally isolated uh, villages from the cities, from markets, farmers cannot it's challenging access to the farm, challenging access to the market. Cities, uh, the, the cities like Nablus, the surrounding villages within two miles or from the city cannot access the market, totally. And, uh, and they cannot re reach the, the, the city. They have to, uh, if they reach the city, they, they reach the city on foot in order to buy uh, uh, food or, or, or medicine or something like this. There's no way to, to do trade. And was uh, totally under siege for years. Same thing with Janine, sometimes uh, open, but most of the times closed. So the farmers, uh, we had periods where the farmers are throwing their product and there is almost starvation in the city and the camp because they are totally isolated from, uh, for, uh, from the rural communities. And the rural communities, if they were to adhere to the rules, they have to stay in the village because you're not, suppo you're not allowed to leave your village. They were ditches and mounds of soil closing all roads leading to every village. And that was not just one village or two, throughout the West Bank. 